everyone. Um, this is a really short sort of commentary uh, review on Shane Dawson's series on Jake Paul um, and basically his other documentaries that he's put out over the last couple of months. I want to talk about this not in a way of criticism but in a way of a conversation. I'm an uh, undergraduate, I have my degree in psychology, I'm in my fourth year honours and I've been studying psychology for five years, well around about six, but we'll call it five because that's really when I started getting into the nitty gritty of psychology on its own without other things kind of jumping in, like other social sciences. The reason I want to talk about this is, honestly, if I had the option to talk to Shane Dawson in a private Skype call for five minutes about this, it'd be a lot easier, but obviously me in Scotland off on my own. I um, have no connection to Shane so there's no way for me to get this information to him but I can get it to you and just talk to you about it and see how you think about it and if you agree or disagree or think I'm being silly and then that's fine and please comment or um, give me a wee message and I can like get back to you as quick as possible. Uh, considering I'm in fourth year that might be like give me a day at least you know I barely sleep anymore I'm like a, a owl with loads of coffee and like it doesn't matter I'm out during the day as well um, with Shane Dawson's series um, there is a aspect that I'm really concerned about which is, as everyone's pointed out and first let's get this big elephant out of the room is the fact that he didn't address the differences between sociopathy and psychopathy enough and there was that general embellishment of the criminal side of sociopathy, of the Hollywood idea of sociopathy. You've got to understand the sociopathy, like any other mental illness, is a deficit or it's um, an inhibited sense of some sort of trait or um, aspect of a personality that is not there. So it's something that's not working properly. So these people are ill. Like anything else, it's an illness. There is no real treatment for it in the sense of where it could be eradicated or bettered. There are some things where it, the person can be guided, um, but that is different across um, every individual. So it changes um, depending on the person seeking help in their own individual sort of environment and upbringing. Sociopathy, for people who don't know, is different from psychopathy in the sense of severity. Psychopathy is a really serious condition where it's, it is very severe and there's a complete lack of empathy and guilt. While the traits between sociopathy and psychopathy are similar, it's thought that sociopaths may be able to form some deep bonds such as like having a love for family where a psychopath cannot. There's another link between guilt in the sense of hurting a stranger, a sociopath would no, feel no guilt, but they may feel guilt over hurting someone close to them or someone they share a bond with. However, psychopaths would not feel this guilt. There's also a thing between antisocial behaviour and sociopath lessons over time. Well, this cannot be said for psychopaths. Psychopaths appear to have no concern whatsoever of the consequences, while a sociopath may learn to avoid consequences over time by reducing antisocial behaviour. You're more likely to find in sociopaths that they exhibit um, repeated violence, uh, violations of law, um, lying, aggression, a reckless like disregard, um, say like where they endanger themselves or others. They're irresponsible in working family environments and they show a lack of remorse. However, psychopathy is linked to more of that Hollywood sense of the super official charm, the dishonesty, the manipulativeness, with all the other um, aspects of sociopathy linked in, but to much a much more severe form. And as a spectrum, you don't just like get your either this or that. It's um, how you are on to a degree. This is still debatable in the literature. There's a lot of authors that still argue it's not a spectrum, but there is strong evidence suggesting it is. So it's something that you could either be quite severe on or less so. So people might have tendencies towards it, um, but they might not exhibit the full form of it. So they can be diagnosed with it. However, their um, 
experience of it, their behavioural output might not be that bad. And you might not look at them and go, right, this is the type of person that would go through this. It's just that they find other ways of dealing with it or they have better coping mechanisms in the sense of family environment. There's a really interesting documentary and I think it's still available on YouTube and if not, um, there's still interview segments that are available and it's to do with genetic theory of sociopathy and psychopathy. A major researcher in this was James Farlin and it's called brain structure theory and it's this idea that your brain is anatomically different depending on if you're more likely to exhibit psychopathy or sociopathic tendency tendencies. Like you have that um, brain that predisposes you to those behaviours genetically but if you're raised in the correct environment that tendency isn't embellished, it doesn't come forth because your environment has managed to um, not eradicate the tendency but managed to hamper it down enough where it doesn't become um, an interference in life in general work performance or relationships this is one thing that Shane doesn't address in his documentary and with anything that is as emotional as mental health being really ironic in using the word emotional but anything that is is um, important is this you have to discuss these points and not to do so is n disrespectful to people that suffer from it people that have um, family members or friends that go through it with it or are victims of it you really have to look at this because not to look at it isn't good enough it isn't it isn't like you can't defend it because as much as you go right oh it's just a viewpoint that's fine but if you're looking to be an investigator or researcher and interviewer then and you want to be as honest as possible and you want to go in there objectively, you need this insight and you need to really discuss it. Shane did an excellent thing by trying to include someone who is in that profession like profession, to come and talk about it. However, he picked someone that was a family therapist to come in and talk about it. He didn't pick someone who was, say, a neuroscientist or someone who specialised in this disorder. He picked someone who picked up a DSM like manual and looked through the diagnostic criteria for it. I could do that. I could uh, two minutes on Google and I could do, I could have done that in first year. And that's saying something. I came out of social sciences through college, but I could have opened that book and sat there and did the exact same thing that she did. She didn't do anything that was different from how someone who didn't have a master's degree or a, a graduate degree like she didn't do anything different from how someone who like wouldn't have had a master's or a, d a graduate degree she'd literally just came in as someone that literally could have just come out of college and uh, said those things and I think that is not representative it's very damaging to people that go through that this is widely discussed anyway with the channel and it's not really a point we need to focus on because if you're watching this video you're probably likely seen the other videos on this um so it's been widely discussed and Shane's defended his point he has said like I'm trying my best with it he put a disclaimer at the start of the following video in the series after the first or second one was posted where he got all the criticism for this exact thing however I still feel like it wasn't enough ethically it's putting people in a position where you're priming them to think that like people with this disorder are immediately dangerous oh it's scary it's a horror film that's not the case yes it's very weird and in the sense of it's not normal because it is a deviant from the normal behavior but it's not in the case where your life is at risk by being around these people yes you need to be careful about things they decide to do and watch the situation you get drawn into but that happens with everyone. There's plenty of people that aren't sociopaths and psychopaths that uh, do really horrible things. Um, so the standards are the same. However, just a tiny wee bit more cautious. Like, this isn't addressed and it's really detrimental to people that suffer with it. But away from this point, because I rambled on about it enough and you get the point, I don't want to keep hammering you on the head with it. My next thing is the ethics behind getting 
the psychologist lady, who's very nice, the family therapist, and to evaluate someone without them knowing. There is a thing in like psychology where you can um, you could hoodwink a participant and not have them know that they're being observed or something's being manipulated and that's fine as long as you get permission from them prior and then uh, reconfirm it with them post the experiment or the situation so after like prior to the experiment you say okay are you up for like just consenting and everything's okay and then after telling them where there was a a dubious situation where they might have been manipulated and if they can agree and say all right that's fine you can still use this data then that's fine you have like your prior and post permission to uh, use this data Shane doesn't do this he does have permission prior with Jake but there was no post confirmation and specifically in documents um, the best thing to keep yourself safe Shane and to anyone doing this is always get it in black and white always get it signed and dated and have an observer because you need to keep yourself safe with these things and your participant safe or whoever um, you've drawn it into it because you don't know what's going to happen after this whole thing you don't know if they're going to go away and say well I was drunk or I was uh, really stressed out that day and that's why I agreed to it and I don't agree with it now do not put yourself in a position where you can be exploited or hurt or where the other person can be exploited or hurt you don't know what's really going on in their head so trying your best to minimize the implication of like hoodwinking someone into it another thing is the woman you used being a family therapist you really do need to get a specialist in in that situation because not having someone who is a specialist in that is really hamping up the degree of like um, severity of like possible consequences where if that person takes that as a diagnosis even if um, they don't get given a like a sort of hypothetical diagnosis of oh you might be um, it still implants that idea in their head that it's worth investigating and there's something there that's not normal about them and you have to be very aware of that um, on just for lawful reasons and ethical reasons to keep yourself in line and in check. Another thing about the series, and this is a huge problem I have with a lot of Shane's content, I'm a subscriber, I followed him for years, even from the early days where I just like ate pizza like in the camera. Um, when he talks to people, he's a very empathi empathetic person. He gets drawn into the conversation and puts his own opinion across quite a lot. That's fine, but when you're conducting an interview with someone and you really, just as a professional standpoint, if you want to get the as close to the truth as possible without manipulating it, um, you don't want to prime that person with your opinion. You want to minimise your effect on that person as much as possible. So if someone's going to lie about something and you give them that sort of monopoly, get out of jail free card where um, you present them with, oh, ethically, this is what I would think, and I think like other people would think this. They're more likely to say what you're saying back, like reiterate it in a different form, like different words, kind of jumble sense. Um, you don't want to prime that. You want to like leave it as natural as possible. So when they're talking, they have to think up the conversation and the words on their own. They don't. Um, have your words to bounce off of necessarily they have the question they have the situation or the problem but they don't have the solution to it their solution comes from them purely and not from you so you want to limit how much you influence that on top of that there's this thing that i really recommend that shane does for future videos specifically dealing with mental health if he does go on to do more on this um mental health first aid training is excellent choice to do in the UK and Scotland I undertook mental health first aid excellent thing to do it cost me an arm and a leg because I had to pay for it and it cost me 70 pounds and that seems like it might seem to some like a really small amount but as a student that was really traumatic and it was horrifying <laughs> seeing that money come out of my account but I was really glad to have made that decision to go through this course um, as well as a counselling course I did in another um, year 
prior to that where you're taught about active listening skills which seems like basic common sense at first where you're told right when you're talking about these things with someone you want to just allow them the room to breathe allow them the room to think up their answers and discuss things naturally to them all you're doing is not parroting back the information they give you but really going right so if someone says oh it was really suffocating and I was really stressed out and the walls felt really closed in and I, c I couldn't get out of the situation I didn't know what to do you would reiterate back to them so you were feeling trapped you were feeling closed in and that's what I'm getting from this would you agree with what I've just said there try and remain away from you as a personal situation and what they're thinking. So try and stick to their narrative because you're really, even though you're leading the conversation and guiding it with your questions, you bounce off of them. They do not bounce off of you. You have to make sure that bouncy ball just stays in that one area of the conversation and doesn't come over to your half of it. It doesn't reach you. It's just between you and uh, like that little gap between them and like you. So it's like it pauses before it gets to you. That bouncy ball should never hit you. It should always be there. Uh, going off of their rhythm and their narrative only. If he goes on to do more videos on this, I would really recommend that he takes a course in it and educates himself in it. Specifically, if he wants to come across as professional and really, if he's empathetic and he really enjoys and nourishes looking after people and really helping them, the best way you can help someone is getting better at your active listening skills. A lot of people think, well, if you remove the personal identification within a conversation, you're removing that empathy, then they're not really getting the point of the conversation. The point is not to put you over them in the sense of you're not trying to pull them into your shoes, you're trying to go into their shoes and understand them. If you think of it in the terms of glasses, for example, everyone has a different prescription depending on the way their eyesight is. So you say you are farsighted and you put glasses on this other person that is short sighted, you're gonna be blurred, like you're not gonna be able to like see their perspective because you're putting on those glasses. But at the same point if you give them your glasses, they're not gonna be able to see either. It's about reaching that middle ground with trying to extrapolate from them what their eyesight is like and what they can see like you can't see it for yourself they have to tell you what is happening in their surroundings this is a, it's a very particular skill I'm still learning it I'm not an expert in it I'm still picking up on it now and it's something I try to exercise every day like day when I'm just talking to people I love and like my partner for example or my family it's a major point in any caring relationship or when you're just trying to look out for someone who's having a particularly rough day so even if you're not doing a documentary series or anything even just like you don't have to do what I did and plunge 70 pounds into a certificate and training in it you could just go and look up reliable sources on it and just see what other people are saying and try to help that guide you if that's something like a skill you want to develop another major point of um, his content is the imagery he uses to describe, like to help um, illuminate the conversation. So he uses imagery that's very scary and upsetting when talking about mental illness. Try and avoid that. Uh, you want to keep it as neutral as possible because you don't know who you're stigmatizing or you're stereotyping. I get the fact that you want to create entertainment that is great but if you're going for a more professional documentary style you want to remove that bias as much as possible and be very aware of that bias if it's implicating what you're trying to say as well as his narrative point falls apart specifically halfway through um, where he drops the whole sociopathy side of things without really concluding anything on it he just stops talking about it that's quite dangerous because there's no worse thing than a point half finished because we don't know if you were going to later on uh, dispute and say well he's clearly not a sociopath we just are left with this half diagnosis thing because even though you were not trying to diagnose him you were just in it for seeing just generally is there any sort of hint there you were presenting this thing of um, 
okay, he might be a sociopath, kind of, and then just left it ambiguous. You didn't even talk about it. So, really, when you're doing your documentary, try and think of it as an essay or report. Have your introduction and your conclusion, and be like between that, you have your argument. So you need to make sure it's there, and every point you bring up is answered at some point. And if it's not answered, in the sense of you have no real answer to it, include it by addressing the fact you have no answer to it. Don't leave it open. And this, these are not criticisms in the sense of, okay, this is why it's all wrong and it's all horrible. It's just for promotion of like more substantial work later. If this is where you want to go, think of these things because they do have a real life impact on people that are watching this content and it's important specifically for younger viewers people that haven't been to university haven't finished school yet or like they don't have that um, input in their life to tell them about these things they don't have that friend or they don't have the money for books or the access to that information if they're relying on you for a source and you want to um be a professional then you have to take on that responsibility that part of what you're doing is educating people in a certain thing regardless of that education is misleading or fact-driven there is that responsibility there so in future please try and recognize that um it was a really good video i do f like video series i do feel that shane was easily kind of hoodwinked by um jake's answers there was that kind of reflective point where when Jake said something Shane was automatically sort of nodding to it and even when he did criticise him it was done so in a way that allowed Jake plenty of freedom and allowed Shane that barrier so Jake couldn't get mad at him because he worded it in a way that wasn't like okay right no I'm stepping up to play I want a clear answer it was very soft edged which is fine and it's perfectly okay but if you want the direct sort of sense of it sometimes you have to be aware of the fact that you're going to upset someone or you're going to make them angry and sometimes it's worth it sometimes it's not but don't be scared to challenge people uh, to find out the truth again I, I wouldn't go out my way to deliberately upset someone but if you are determined to find out the truth and the reality of the situation you cannot be scared to step up to the challenge you cannot be scared of that reaction. Yes, privately frightened, go home, cry a wee bit, get curl up like a croissant in bed. Um, fine, that's mostly what I do from day to day things, but take courage in the fact that you're seeking out an objective, unbiased truth. And if you're going with that, you're always going to be fine. Again, guys, this was supposed to be a short video, so sorry for keeping you for as long as I have. I hope at some point, like, some of the information was interesting if you stuck this long thank you very much i love you you're a lovely person uh just have a good night good day good afternoon uh, wherever you are and i hope that you're doing well in your day give me a wee message or a comment or anything like that if you just want to chat or ask any questions like i'll talk to you later okay have a nice one bye